Good morning everyone. Welcome to this new message on this new day. Before we begin, let's commit this time to the Lord. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Your word is truth. And we thank you for it. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that guides us into all truth. We pray that Heavenly Father you would Guide us today as we read and study your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah, brother. Join me, if you will, and let us read together Jude, chapter 1. We're going to read the whole chapter, which is all there is of Jude. Jude, chapter 1, verses 1 to 25. That's the whole chapter, the whole book actually, the whole epistle. Jude, verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men, turning the grace of our God unto lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. And the angels which kept their, not their first estate but left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise common dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. These are spots in your feasts of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds. Trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness for ever. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam prophesied of these things, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. 
But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you that there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the Spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And some, and of some, have compassion, making a difference. And others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to prevent you faultless, present you, sorry, faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. And let us all say together, Amen. I've called this message, my brothers and sisters, the struggle for faith in the last days. The struggle for faith in the last days. And brethren, I have to say I have felt constrained by the Lord to deliver this message, this particular message today. I do not really know why, other than to bring a solemn warning to the body of Christ. We live, I think that you'll agree, in a tumultuous and confusing time. As a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, I cannot think of a more perilous time to be in this world. And yes, I am fully aware that there have been far more dangerous times physically such as two world wars. There have been plagues and so on and so on. However, although there are plenty of physical threats around today, such as terrorism, county lines, crimes, and at the present time, lethal viruses, and so on, there is a far more perilous threat to you and to I and to me if we are in Christ Jesus, than any of these. The threats I speak of today, my brothers and sisters, are those which are aimed at our minds. Now the state of our minds affects and to a great extent controls our character and our personality, and especially our emotional state. That is why this epistle of Jude to the body of Christ in his day is so relevant to the body of Christ today, in our day. It's certainly no coincidence, and I'll repeat, no coincidence, that this epistle was placed immediately before the book of Revelation, the final book of the New Testament writings. So then with with this in mind, we'll begin our study today. And our study is going to focus really on mainly the first four verses. And later, some of the later verses. But initially, we're going to look at the first four verses, because this really is where the core of Jude's message is. So let's begin. Let's look first at Jude's greeting, the first two verses of his epistle. Let's read them both together. Jude, verses 1 and 2. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. 
Now I'd like you to notice the two following points in Jude's first verse. Number one, those that are sanctified by God the Father. And number two, that we are preserved in Jesus Christ. We're sanctified by God the Father and we are preserved in Jesus Christ. These are two important points in Jude's first line, his first verse of this letter to the church. Now these opening points are to both reinforce and strengthen faith in the believer, in the listener, in the receivers of Jude's epistle. As you'll see as we study the wording used by Jude. Now first of all the word sanctified is the Greek word hagiadzo, hagiadzo and it means to make holy that is ceremonially purify or consecrate and it can mean mentally to venerate, to hallow, to be holy, to sanctify, to make pure. Now it's God the Father who initiates the move towards our salvation. He draws us to Christ. Turn with me if you will to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. We're going to read verse 44. John chapter 6 verse 44. <coughs> Excuse me. John chapter 6 verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. I'll read it again. No man can come up to me. This is Jesus speaking. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. Now this is a glimpse of the limitless love of God whereby he sent his only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world to satisfy the wrath of God over sin. That's why he came, brethren. Then according to his foreknowledge, he draws man to his own Son. He draws man to his Son. He, by the Holy Spirit, brings the conviction of sin into the very heart of that man, then upon confession of that sin and repentance of the same, he grants eternal forgiveness of that sin and salvation comes through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ at Calvary. The forgiven man is then sanctified through the shed blood of Christ, made holy before a holy God. Hallelujah! What a mighty and glorious God we serve, don't we? The overriding element in all of this, though, is the love of God. This is why Jude states the following later on in his epistle. Jude, verse 21. Jude, verse 21. He says, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Jude then brings us the second point. The second point. We're preserved in Jesus Christ. In Christ Jesus, sorry. Preserved in Christ Jesus. The word translated in the King James at least, it may be different in your version, but the word in the King James translated as preserved in the English here is actually the Greek word tereo, tereo and that means to attend to carefully, to take care of, to guard, metaphorically to keep one in the state in which he is, to observe, to reserve, to undergo something. But it's to, to keep, it's to keep in the state in which you are. So a more accurate translation of that word tereo would be 
keep, to guard, to take care of. Now please notice, if you will, that Jude reminds his listeners, including now you and I, of the source and assuredness of the final triumph of the believer's salvation. In order to dispel any of the, any and all really, doubt and anxiety which may be caused by the trials and tribulations that he is about to broach throughout his epistle. Let me repeat that. Jude here is reminding his listeners through these two points that of the assuredness of the final triumph of the believer's salvation in order to dispel, to get rid of any and all doubt or anxiety that may be caused by the trials and tribulations he's about to talk about, to broach through this epistle, this letter. So let us carry on. Let's look at now the, the warnings about false teachers. Because this is part of Jude's message. Jude verse 3 and 4. Let's read together. Jude verses 3 and 4. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was need needful sorry, for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our Lord God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now Jude, brethren, as the wise and loving brother in Christ he was, sees the growing danger about him within the church of false teachers and also of the false doctrine that they bring rising against the true church. Indeed, the Apostle Peter himself writes in a similar vein. If, in fact, there are many points in Jude's epistle that echo accurately the words of, of the Apostle Peter in his own second epistle that precedes this in the New Testament. This second epistle of Peter was written to the same people to whom his first was written, as can be clearly seen here if we read quickly 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia. Now these five areas that Peter mentions are all in what was called Asia Minor, now known as modern day Turkey. Now in Peter's second epistle he writes this. I'm going to read the, the first three verses of Peter's second epistle. 2 Peter 2 verses 1 to 3. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And though covenantous, covenantousness, and through, I apologise, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Now, although Peter's epistle was aimed at these churches in Asia Minor, the dangers faced by them is one which would be common not only 
to the believers of the days of Peter and Jude, but throughout the church, universally up to and including the day in which we live today. These false teachers are, along with their pernicious doctrines and ways, are in fact simply tools of the oldest enemy of God, that being of course the devil, Satan. This Satan, who as the thief that he is, comes only to steal, to kill and to destroy. We read that in John chapter 10 verse 10. The thief comes only to steal, to kill and to destroy. John 10 verse 10. Now let's read again, if you will, the third and fourth verses of our text. Jude verses 3 and 4. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our Lord God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I hope that you can see why Jude gave all diligence to write about the common salvation to these believers. When he talks about the common salvation, he's talking about the simple gospel of salvation. It was Jesus who lived, was put to death, died, buried, rose again, victorious to life and now sits at the right hand of God ever interceding for us. He's to write about the common salvation to these believers and they, that they themselves should earnestly contend for this faith which was once delivered unto them. Now let's, let's take a look at some of the wording that Jude uses because it's vital that you and I really understand completely what Jude is saying and the urgency in his words. <clears throat> now the word diligence is the Greek word spude, spude, and it means speed. That means by all dispatch, eagerness, earnestness, uh, haste, doing something quickly. Simply put, it means that Jude, upon a serious thought and consideration of the situation throughout the church, had decided that it was imperative to act swiftly, to bring a corrective word to them. That's what it means to give all diligence to write about the common salvation and that these believers should earnestly contend. Jude was extremely concerned about the, the very salvation of those within the body of Christ, given the effects upon believers of these false teachers that were spreading throughout the church, the body of Christ. His spirit led advice to them was that they must earnestly contend for the faith which had once brought them deliverance from sin, the pure gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the truth of the word of God. Now the words of Jude that you should earnestly contend for are in fact one Greek word and it's quite a long and complicated word so please bear with me and forgive me if I pronounce it incorrectly. It is epagonizomai, epagonizomai, epagonizomai and it means to struggle for, to earnestly contend for. More importantly it's from two other words the first word is epi, which means upon, at or for. And the second word is 
agonizomi, agonizomi, and that means to struggle, to literally compete for a prize, Conti to contend with an adversary, to endeavour to accomplish something, to labour, to fervently strive. But I think that struggle, literally, to compete for a prize, really sums up this word earnestly contend for, to, co to compete for a prize, which is exactly what we are all doing. We're all in this marathon together, on this straight and narrow way, aiming for the prize of complete salvation in Christ Jesus. That is coming again. What Jude is getting at here is that a great struggle occurred at the moment of our salvation. I don't know whether any of you can remember that battle that went on internally. A great battle between our sinful nature at the time and the conviction of sin within us by the Holy Spirit. The victory over that sinful nature required our death. Death to self. Death to that old nature whose owner and God with a small g was Satan himself. It involved our death. And as I've stated many, many times in my messages throughout the years, the battle does not end there at salvation. We have merely passed through the straight gate. The fact remains that we have also a straight and narrow way to negotiate. Now those of you who are used to my messages will probably be bored stiff with those words because I've mentioned them so often, but they're important to remember, brethren. This is where the struggle to earnestly contend for and maintain the most holy faith which we once received must continue to the end. It was the propensity to just sit back and rest on their or our initial salvation and believe that it is enough to get us to heaven, which was a concern to Jude. It was also to Peter and to all of the writers of the New Testament. And it is also a concern to me, hence the bringing of this message. Now Jude's message to earnestly contend for the faith is a timely reminder that this is in fact a battle. A struggle, if you will, to maintain and increase, to grow in our most holy faith against the wiles of the devil. Remember, saints, my brothers and sisters, this is why the Apostle Paul taught about putting on the whole armour of God. You can find that if you don't know about it in Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 to 20. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 10 to 20. Putting on the whole armour of God. Now you only need protection of armour if there's a great threat to be both fought against and also be protected from. That's obvious, you wouldn't otherwise wear armour, would you? Unless you were in a battle or preparing for a battle. Now I want to focus on the fourth verse of Jude. I'll read it again. Jude verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now here, in this fourth verse, Jude gives the reason for his warning to believers to fight for and defend the truth of the faith we once received and that changed our lives. That reason was and is false teachers with false doctrine. <coughs> Excuse me. 
men who had crept into the church with deception. These men on the surface had the appearance of being godly. However, they carry with them pernicious ways and ideas that brought a corrupted message to the body of Christ. As we saw in Peter's second epistle, I'll read it again, 2 Peter 2 verses 1 to 3. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers amongst you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. There were men with many different and diverse false doctrines. Some were planted by Judaizers to draw back uh, believers back under the law of Moses. Others were adherents to false ideas of just who and what Jesus was. The variations of false doctrine abounding at the time are too many, too varied to go into here today. But they may be subject for another message on another day quite soon. I think that's important to cover now. Now these, there are resources available to all of you who wish to study them for yourselves, but I may bring a message about them at another time. Suffice to say though, just as there were devious men in Jude's day and Peter's day, so there are today. Make no mistake, there are devious men in the body of Christ today. These men and women, by the way, will believe that what they say or teach is true. However, if you stand back and look at what they are actually saying, preaching or teaching, it will no doubt result in self-satisfaction, self-aggrandizement, self-confidence and so on. It's all to make the believer happy, feel better, feel good about themselves. Have you ever wondered why it is that so many so-called believers move from one church fellowship to another? They may say they didn't like the pastor or they didn't like the type of worship or that they couldn't get on with other people and so on. Brethren, this kind of thinking is false. It is not true Christianity. Yes, there may be, in fact, valid reasons for leaving a fellowship. But these, I have stated, are not of those. The type of thinking that leads believers to these type of actions are planted by false preachers and false teachers in the body of Christ. I've stated many times in my walk with the Lord and bringing messages that anything that anything that pleasure or satisfaction of self is not true Christianity, but it's humanism. Anything that, produ yeah, that calls for the pleasure of or satisfaction of self is not true Christianity, it is humanism. The happiness of man is the core of humanism. Brethren, we are not in the business of the happiness of man. We're in the business, if you could call it a business, it's not a business, it's a vocation to bring glory to God. The glory of God the Father and of his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to bring honour and glory to his name is and should be our driving force. Not the pleasure and satisfaction of man. I have to say, brothers and sisters, that there is much of humanism in the church today. And that is one of our biggest problems. It has arisen because believers 
not taking seriously the warnings of the likes of Peter and Jude and Paul and others in the word of God. We have forgotten the true faith, the truth that we were once, that once we received and the truth that changed us from sinner to saint. We have been lulled into, begin, into believing that it's okay to use the world's ways and methods in the church. It is not. We have also been lulled into believing that we can live and act like the world does in order to teach them. We cannot. These, my brethren, are lies from the pit of hell itself. We are told just as those in Jude's day were. We are to be light in this world. Light does not try to be darkness to overcome it. It remains light because the scripture says, turn with me, if you will, to the Gospel of John, chapter 12. Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 35 and 36. The Gospel of John, verse 12, verse 35. Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may be children of the light. These things spoke Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. Also here, turn again with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26, verse 18. Acts 26, verse 18. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. That they turn from darkness to light. And once again, 1 John chapter 1 verse 7. 1 John chapter 1 verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of jesus christ his son cleanses us from all sin there are many more references to believers being light or being in the in the light in this dark world but we will only be light brethren as long as we remain in the light as this last scripture told us 1 John 1 verse 7 underline that scripture highlight it in your Bible put it on your refrigerator but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all sin God is light and in him is no darkness at all Memorise these verses, brethren. So to, to bring this together, to bring this to a conclusion, what is the core of Jude's message to us as we are today? Well, just as there was in his day, today there are many and varied instruments, wiles and attacks of the devil against the body of Christ. They're all designed to wound, to damage, or to destroy the work in us that was and is being wrought by God. We must be aware of them, saints, and be able to recognise them for what they are when they come. We will only be able to do that if we both know the truth and we continue to be grounded in the truth. So, just as did Jude, our brother in Christ, I applore you today to 
contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered unto you. Brethren, read the word. Study the word. Remain in the word, whatever comes against you. Put on the full armour of God and use it wisely. For the devil's attacks are not always obvious ones. Hence we need wisdom and discernment which only come by being in the light. By being in Christ and growing in Christ through reading his word, through prayer, spending time with our Lord and Saviour in these elements and being approved unto God and not unto man. Our job is not to be approved unto our neighbour, to be approved unto someone else. Our work is to be approved unto God. So in closing, my brethren, my dear brethren, I'll leave you with some wise words of Jude, which come later on in his epistle. Jude, verses 20 to 23. Jude, verses 20 to 23. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Brethren, neither you nor I can afford to relax in these last days. We cannot afford to let down our guard. We must keep on the armour of God. We must keep it upon us. Use it wisely. Know how to use it wisely. Practice with it. The helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the girdle of truth, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel and so on. We cannot afford to relax in these last days. We must continue to make sure our salvation and to keep in the light. Let us all, brothers and sisters, contend earnestly as our brother Jude exhorts us to. Because even the smallest light will overcome the darkest darkness. May God bless you and keep you. Thank you.